Come on. Well, both my wife and I grew up on small farms in the southwest. I trained as a, a radio tech, so some of the things from a technical perspective, but back in 1988 we bought Baronia Farm at Donnybrook. How's a cookie? Yeah, they're a bloody aerial rabbit. <laughs> aerial rabbit. There's all this bullshit about technology, and the, the technology might change things, but only if technology can be used so that you can scan something before you buy it and see if it's got, worth eating. The future of our civilization is looking after the biology in the top four, six, eight inches of, of this planet. And you look at the massive dust storms in the east at the moment. This never used to happen when Aboriginal people were managing the Australian landscape. It's a product of our failed agricultural slash economic system. A flood to some extent is a symptom, another symptom of a failed land management system. Now in extreme events of course you're always going to have floods but the more organic matter you have in the soil the more capacity that soil has to hold water and the less of it is running off. So from a farming point of view our challenge is to make the soils as water retentive as possible. You know when you buy a farm you're buying a capacity to convert solar energy into a saleable product. You know, as we build the soil organic matter from 1% to 2 or 3 or 4%, that's pulling vast quantities of carbon out of the atmosphere. And this is a whole message of regenerative agriculture. It's about building the soil to make it more productive, but it's also locking up carbon. And as it holds carbon, then it holds more water. And as it holds more water, then you, you get less flooding and you get longer growth through the dry seasons. The real flaw of industrial agriculture, it's, it's based on fossil fuels. Nitrogen fertilizers made out, made out of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are just billion year old sunlight. You know, so the sustainability, we've got to get to a balance where the, the, the population and the energy demands are matched by the, the energy coming into the, our ecosystem every year, not drawing on, on, on energy that's come into the planet billions of years ago. From a consumer's point of view, I hate the word consumers, we should say eaters. You know, when we talk consumers, we're talking about the commoditization of food. And, and that is the problem. We've, we've got to get away from seeing food as a commodity. It's not a commodity, it's a foundation of our civilization. And, and we've got to value it, and we've perhaps got to pay a little bit more for it. We do have choices. We can, we've got the situation, and it's been driven by advertising, which in turn has been driven by the commercial media. You know, people will spend top dollar for a designer t-shirt or a bag or something but still want cheap food, you know. Like, the payoff is that we're not spending so much on, on the medical system and, you know, at the moment we're, talking, we're putting more and more money into research into cancer but we put very little into the cause, you know, cause and effect. Uh, and I understand if you've got cancer you want to find a cure, but rather than doing all this research into cures, we should be doing more to research prevention. Charles Massey's call of the reed warbler, A New Agriculture, A New Earth, is quite profound. To me, this book is more significant than Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. What, to me, is so great is that Charlie's saying what I've always believed, but he's qualified to say it. And I think it's really exciting that your generation is, uh, is taking this on. The key for this to be successful, the, the eaters have got to become aware of the issues. Um, and as Charles Massey says, as the urban populations become aware of the issues of industrial agriculture, I think this change will be unstoppable and it's what Charlie calls an underground revolution.